Hi and welcome to C3 York's Online. Today we are talking about one of the most destructive issues that still exists in society today. We're talking about adultery. But did you know that Jesus makes it a far deeper issue that can affect every single one of us? Our York pastor, Gavin Gray, is going to continue our series based on the Ten Commandments with this and uh, he's going to share his thoughts on the Seventh Commandment, Do Not Commit Adultery. Hi everyone. Well, today we're looking at the seventh of the commandments, which is simply stated as this, you shall not commit adultery. At face value, this command seems quite straight to the point and could probably be summed up with these next three words, don't do it. But of course, there's actually so much more that we need to unpack in order to understand why God gave this command and to see how God wants us to live our lives instead. As we spend time on this command today, I know this is often a challenging command to look at as there's potentially some people watching who may have been through this personally or it's happened to a loved one or a close friend. So we know the hurt and the feelings caused by this situation. On the other hand though, this is a really important command for us to look at because you may be watching and thinking, well, I'm not married so this command isn't relevant to me. Or we can easily think, think things like, oh, I would never do that because I know it's wrong. Well, as we're about to see over these next few moments, maybe this command is more relevant to us than we may sometimes realize. So let's dive straight in with the question. Why does God give this specific command to his people? Well, to begin with, we need to, rem to remind ourselves that there were a number of reasons why God gave the Ten Commandments to his people. One reason was to build community. At the time when God gave these commandments to the Israelites, he'd recently freed them from 400 years of slavery. So God was in the process of helping them to rebuild their community and culture again. God in his wisdom knew how community and society best functions. God knows that when we live by these 10 commandments, we become people who are adding to the building of society rather than doing anything that may undermine it. It's interesting, isn't it, that in today's world, a lot of societies all across the world are still built on these 10 things that God said to Moses on a remote mountainside all those years ago. A second reason, though, why God gave us these commands is because he wants his people to be set apart. God wanted his people to, to live in a way distinct from others so that they would reflect his nature to the other nations around them. One of these ways was the context of marriage. See, in the Bible, God wants his people to be faithful to their spouse and to keep the promises that they've made to them as a reflection that our God is a promise-keeping God faithful in all he does. We also see in various biblical passages that as we honour our spouse, we are also honouring Christ. The purpose of marriage is set out for us by God in Genesis chapter 2, which says this. That is why man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now, this verse is significant for us as we see that for God, marriage is far more than just a legal agreement. It's far more than just two people now deciding to live together or to socialize together as a couple. But rather the Bible states that within marriage, the man and the woman become one. Now, this idea is reflected further by Jesus in Mark chapter 10, when the religious leaders are asking him about divorce. And Jesus replies by drawing reference to the words of Genesis 2, stating that at the beginning, God created them man and woman, male and female. And then the two become flesh, the two become one. Then he states this in verse 9. He says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. 
See, for God, marriage is a lifelong, wholesome union as one flesh together. So if that is biblical marriage, what then is adultery? Well, a basic understanding is that adultery is undermining or breaking the wedding vows that have been made. It's undermining this understanding that we are now one flesh with our spouse, done so by being unfaithful to them, by being in a sexual relationship with someone else. Also though, according to the words of Jesus, adultery is committed when someone breaks the bond by deciding to leave their spouse for no reason at all in order to marry somebody else. A famous example of this subject in the Bible is King David, and it's found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. In this passage, we're told that one day David gets out of his bed. He goes up onto the roof of his palace, and while he's doing so, he sees a beautiful woman called Bathsheba, who is bathing. David finds this beautiful woman so attractive that he sends out his friend to go and find more information. You know, like when you like someone and you send a friend to go and suss out the potential of, is this potentially could go anywhere? Well, that idea began here with David. Anyway, news comes quickly back to him that this is Bathsheba, who is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. In that moment of receiving this news, that this was a married woman, it, it should have been the end of it because David knew the commandments. However, rather than it's been the end of it, he allows his lust for this beautiful woman to become the main factor here. And so in verse four, it tells us that even though he knew who she was, he commanded one of his messengers to go and get her. And we're told that when they brought her to him, he slept with her and she became pregnant. He is now in a complete mess. And so in response to all of this, he now begins to make plans for her husband Uriah to be killed so that no one would find out what has happened. So he does. He arranges for Uriah to be killed at battle. The Bible tells us that when the news come of his death, Bathsheba, his wife, mourns for her husband and then she marries David. It seems like if David has got away with all of this, but in the last line of 2 Samuel chapter 11 states this, but the thing David has done displeased the Lord. And from that point onwards, David now has to live with the consequences of his actions. Okay, so that is some of the background to all of this, and we'll come back to some of that in a moment. But what has this got to do with our lives today? Well, let's turn to Matthew 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount. In this passage, Jesus is teaching a large crowd on how to live and what it means to live as a child in God's kingdom. One of the first things we need to remember, though, is that when Jesus teaches this, he actually teaches that he's not come to abolish the law, but has come to fulfill it. We see this in verse, in verse 17. And so in everything Jesus is about to say, he doesn't take away from the law or reduces it. He also doesn't add to the law. But rather, he reveals a deeper understanding that our holiness isn't just based on the external actions of our lives, but our holiness also addresses our inner beliefs and the condition of our hearts. In this sermon, Jesus makes a powerful statement six times, which is this. You have heard it said, but I tell you. In all six times when Jesus states, you have heard, he mentions external actions that they'd been taught from the law. But in all six of his, but I say, he, he turns the focus away from the external in order to address the deeper internal actions of the heart. And this is what he says when he mentions adultery in verse 27. It says this, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. That was the commandment. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Can you see what Jesus has done here? In the context of adultery, he shows that adultery is far more than just our external actions. And it's even more than just us physically staying away from those things. But he reveals that this is also an internal heart issue. 
See, Jesus shows them through this teaching that God has so much more for them. And so he encourages them to not just have an external pious righteousness based on actions, but rather to allow God's word to challenge and to change the way that they think. This is why I believe that this commandment is probably more really relevant to us than maybe we sometimes realize because although we may never go through with the actions of adultery because we know it is wrong and we know it's harmful, what about our thought patterns and the eternal, internal thinking which may also cause us harm or put a barrier up that stops us from living the fullness of life that God has for us. So in light of this, Jesus gives some pretty clear teaching. Listen to how strong his teaching is. It says this in verse 29. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to go into hell. Now, this is strong teaching. You know, he is giving a, a graphic picture of what we should do if this is an issue for us. But does God really want us to literally remove our eyes or to cut off our hands? No, because if he did, then we would all know more one-handed blind people than we do right now. What it does mean, though, is that Jesus wants us to address this internal issue, and it may sometimes require us taking drastic external action in order to help us address something internal. This is what it could look like for someone today. If, you, if, if your eye was causing you to sin, then, then a simple but drastic action could be around what you choose to watch. For example, while the whole world seems to be watching that, that TV series and talking about that movie, maybe we decide to protect ourselves by not watching it. Maybe it's deciding that we're not going to watch TV after a certain time at night or alone. Maybe it's deciding that we're not going to have certain apps on our phone. Maybe it's deciding that you're not going to go to certain places because you know there'll be temptation there for you. Maybe the drastic action is actually you confiding in somebody who you trust so that they can help you. Because the Bible talks a lot about bringing to light areas of temptation. But let's be clear though, it's not just about avoiding the external action. The focus of Jesus' teaching is on the internal. Uh, internal. Uh, it's by staying away from those external things that it gives us space and freedom to work on the internal without feeding what we may be trying to change. Okay, so as we know, this series is not just about the do's and do nots. It's also about discovering how God wants us to live as his people. So what can we learn today to help us to address these internal issues? Well, here are four keys for us today. Number one, pray for God to help. You see, prayer is us inviting God into the process because we don't make these changes in our own strength or understanding. But what do we pray? Well, listen to this prayer in Psalm 51 verse 10. It says this, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Out of all the people mentioned in the Bible, guess who prayed this prayer? David. This was David's prayer. You know, David, the one who, who broke this commandment, and, and not just internally, but externally as well. This prayer was prayed by David, the, the one who should have walked away from the situation, but instead pursued his own desires. You know, if we'd carried on with the rest of that story over the next few chapters of 2 Samuel, we can see that God reveals everything that, that had happened to a prophet called Nathan. And Nathan then goes and confronts David about it. And as he does so, David becomes repentant of his sin and God in his amazing grace comes and redeems the situation. And as part of that repentance, David writes this Psalm 51. In fact, let me just read a bit more of it to us. 
says this in verse one. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. My sin. Verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. You know, if we want that inner change, then the first thing we need to do is pray. We can ask God for, for his strength, knowing that God is with us, that he is for us, and that he wants to be part of this process. See, God answers honest, open prayers like this. He wants to, to help create in us a pure heart, to create in us a, a steadfastness in our spirits, and to give us a willing spirit to sustain us. When we ask God for help, we are literally handing our needs, our wants, our desires over to him. So we can pray to God to help us with this change. Number two, choose to feed your mind and soul with good food. It says this in Philippians 4 verse 8. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I love that. I love what it says there, whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is good, then this is what we should be thinking about. You know, this links back to what I was saying just a few moments ago, that this uh, is more than just a stop in our external actions. We need to be intentional about our internal. You know, there's so much going on in our world that can easily take our focus and it can end up feeding us a diet of junk food. But this, what we're saying in Philippians, this is wholesome food. When we focus on the good things, it's gonna feed us good food in our lives. How better to be intentional than to dwell on the right things? And as we do so through the power of the Holy Spirit, bringing us truth and truth formation and transformation, it helps us in our lives so we begin to see change and breakthrough in the way we think and the way we act. And of course, as we do these things, where is this going to lead us again? It leads us straight to God the Father. Why? Because He is those things. It is who He is. Number three, invite Jesus into your relationships. You know, this is especially for if you are married, but it's also for if you are single and have friends of the opposite sex, because we want all our relationships to be wholesome and upright. Inviting Jesus in helps keep our relationships wholesome and pure. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 12 says this, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. You know, in the context of marriage, this is inviting Jesus to be central and at the core of our union as we become one flesh. When we do so, it helps because he brings us strength to overcome challenges and he also gives us guidance on how we can treat each other. So we need to make sure we're inviting Jesus into our relationships and not just that, also making room for him. Number four, see your marriage as a reflection and extension of God's love for his bride, the church. And it's also a reflection and extension of our love for him. Ephesians 5, it gives us a beautiful revelation of how God sees marriage. Let me just begin to bring us to a close today by, by just highlighting some of the things that, that it says here in this passage. It says this in verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
So how do I view my, my union with my wife Janine? It's this, that we submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. The more we can do these things, the, the, the less tempted we may be and the more we can be operating together as one. Verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Verse 25. Husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing through water of, by, with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. You see, the way we view our marriages, the way we view our relation with others, it's a reflection of how God sees his church. And as I've just said, it also is a reflection of our love for him. As I honor my wife, I'm honoring Christ. As I honor the uh, relationship, the, the one flesh that we've now become, as I take myself away from temptation and, and focus on the goodness of who we are together, it actually helps to honor God and to reflect who He is in our lives. Let me conclude with this today. When it comes to this commandment and also some of the other ones we've looked at as well, Let's not be people who think, well, we're okay because, you know, I've not done a specific external action. But let's commit ourselves to being people who, who allows the Word of God, who allows the Spirit of God, allow the power of God to truly transform us from the inside out. Come on, church, let's pray. Well, God, we thank you for your Word. Thank you that, that as we've just seen that that on one hand, this may seem quite a, an easy, obvious thing for us to know. But Lord God, you are wanting us to address the internal thoughts of our hearts. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that, that you help us and guide us. Thank you, Jesus, that you can help to, to bring truth to our lives. And, and so we want to submit ourselves to today, Jesus. And we want to say, come and help us. We want to have that internal transformation that you speak about. Come and help us that so that we'll no longer be, be led by our own desires. But as we focus on you, as we feed on, on who you are and the wholesomeness that you have for us, may our lives be transformed. Thank you, Jesus, for your help today. Amen. Oh yes, 
You deserve it all. You deserve it all. We give you the highest praise. You deserve it all. You deserve it all. We give you the highest praise. You deserve it all. You deserve it all. We give you the highest praise. You deserve it all. You deserve it all. Great. Well, I really do hope that you have been enjoying this series. Uh, let me ask, you know, what has impacted you so far? We would love to hear your thoughts, stories, experiences. So why don't you post something in the comments or you can drop us a, a message at c3yorks.church forward slash connect. You can also use that link to ask for prayer or share your stories, especially if some of these issues that we're talking about has affected you personally. We'd love to be there helping you uh, through whatever situation that you might be going through. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, and, sub and share uh, if you found today's message helpful and if you haven't already done so do subscribe to the channel it'll it'll notify you then whenever we post new content and also if you'd like to bring a tithe or, or give an offering towards the work that we do as a, as a church you can do that through our website all the details are on your screen right now Finally, we really do believe that there's great strength in finding community. So if you're in the Leeds or the York area, come and say hi. Why don't you join us for one of our live in-person gatherings. We meet in Leeds and York every Sunday at the same time, well, same time it's for, the, for the services at 10.30 a.m. All of the details of when and where are on our website. And we're back here next Sunday at 10.30 a.m. as well. Till then, have a great week and God bless.